Coming up on Arirang News. Iranian President Ebrahim Raisi has been killed in a helicopter crash in mountainous northwestern Iran. Sending shockwaves around the world, eyes are on what happens next amid growing tensions in the Middle East. South Korea and England are co-hosting a global AI summit in Seoul this week, aiming to reach an agreement with world leaders on fostering innovation, safety and inclusivity in artificial intelligence. It's been two years since South Korea's former presidential office, Cheongwade, or the Blue House, was open to the public. We take a look at the range of events taking place in celebration. Good evening, it's 9 p.m. here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us on Arirang News. We begin in the Middle East. Iranian President Ebrahim Raisi has been killed in a helicopter crash in mountainous northwestern Iran, sending shockwaves around the world. Our Shin Zhebyeok has the latest. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi and Iran's foreign minister have been confirmed dead after the helicopter they were traveling in crashed on Sunday. That is according to Iran's mayor news agency on Monday. Rescuers located the helicopter carrying the president and eight others in the mountainous region of northwest Iran where they found no sign of life. In the early hours of Monday, a Turkish drone identified a heat source suspected to be the wreckage of the helicopter. The detected heat source was located near the village of Tavil in Iran, approximately 30 kilometers from the Azerbaijani border. The Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps also confirmed that the heat source found by the Turkish drone could be the wreckage of the helicopter carrying President Raisi. President Raisi had been in Azerbaijan for the opening of a dam with the country's president, Ilham Aliyev. Both the U.S. and the EU are watching developments surrounding the crash cautiously. U.S. President Joe Biden is said to have been briefed on the incident during his visit to the state of Georgia, with U.S. officials keeping close tabs on the story. European Council President Charles Michel also said he is watching for developments carefully but did not elaborate further. Many countries with strained relations with Tehran have remained quiet on the matter. However, countries like Saudi Arabia and Turkey a have expressed support for Iran, saying they are ready to provide any help required for search operations. Shin se Arirang News. Now, eyes are on what happens next in Iran with the sudden death of its president. Our foreign affairs correspondent Pei Eunji explains. Ibrahim Raisi, a hardliner and religiously conservative politician, was elected as Iran's president in 2021. The 63-year-old enforced brutal crackdowns on protests over repressive laws, such as the mandatory hijab rules. Mass protests went on for months in Iran starting in late 2022 over the death of a 22-year-old woman, Masha Amini, who had been detained over allegedly not wearing a hijab. In Iran, the president is the second highest ranking official after the supreme leader. Raisi was long seen as a potential successor to the current supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, who holds ultimate power regarding domestic and foreign affairs in the country. Khamenei sought to reassure the public in a statement on Saturday, saying the Iranians should not worry. Be sure that there will be no disruption to the work of the country. Raisi's death comes at a sensitive time for Iran and amid growing tensions in the Middle East over Israel's war against Hamas. Last month, Iran launched an unprecedented drone and missile attack on Israel, marking its first ever direct attack on the country in response to an Israeli airstrike on Iran's consulate. With the sudden death of Raisi, an expert says a ferocious struggle for power may have begun. Ibrahim Raisi was a very leading contender for the position of the supreme leader. Now, the big question in Iran is what happens when Ayatollah Khamenei, who is 95, uh, passes away, um, who is going to be the next supreme leader? Um, a key contender for that was or is uh, Ibrahim Raisi. 
Um, and so with him out of the way, that would be very significant. Under the Iranian constitution, Vice President Mohammad Mober is expected to become the country's interim president. He will be part of a three-person council along with the Speaker of Parliament and the head of judiciary that will arrange a new presidential election within 50 days of the president's death. This means a new election is expected to be held by early July instead of in 2025. Pei Arirang News. In response, the South Korean government on Monday expressed its condolences to the people of Iran and the bereaved families of those who died. In a written statement by its spokesperson, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs shared its deep condolences for the Iranian people for the sudden loss of their leader and hoped that they would overcome their sorrow through unity. Shifting gears. South Korea and the United Kingdom will co-host the AI Seoul Summit this week, beginning Tuesday. It's expected to set out a vision for governing the technology, expanding on the declaration made at the AI Safety Summit in England last year. Our Oh Soo-young tells us what to expect. South Korea and Britain are working to reach a joint statement with world leaders on advancing innovation, safety and inclusivity in artificial intelligence in a virtual summit co-hosted by the two nations. In the briefing Monday, South Korea's top office said the AI Seoul Summit will kick off on Tuesday, with the leaders of G7 nations Singapore and Australia invited to follow up on the first AI Safety Summit last November. While the Bletchley Park Summit focused on addressing threats to humanity posed by the fast-evolving technology, this whole session will expand the agenda to include innovation and inclusivity, with leaders expected to adopt an agreement on the way forward. Heads of international organizations, including the United Nations and the European Union, as well as global tech giants like Samsung, Naver, Google, Amazon and OpenAI have also been invited. Participants will hold a balanced discussion on not only the risks posed by AI, but also its positive aspects and how AI can contribute to humanity. In a joint op-ed on Monday, President Yoon suk and British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak emphasized the need for global standards to regulate and mitigate risks posed by AI, to transform lives for the better and stop the global race to the bottom. They said the AI's whole summit is expected to set out a vision for multilateral governors of the technology to tackle global challenges such as poverty and climate change. President Yoon, beginning with his New York initiative in 2022, has actively promoted global efforts to form norms on advancing digital innovation for the benefit of humanity, whilst expanding access and rights to gain from technology. On the second day of the summit, a ministerial session and the AI Global Forum will take place offline to expand the conversation. The AI Global Forum aims to advance discussions with various stakeholders, including governments, firms, experts and civil society, under the theme of governance for embracing AI safety innovation. A presidential official told reporters China was not invited to join the leaders' meeting, in line with the first AI safety summit, but Beijing has agreed to participate in the ministerial session on Wednesday. Acknowledging the differences on governing technology, namely between liberal democracies and Beijing, the official said such issues are likely to be discussed throughout the summit. Yun's office says by leading the comprehensive conversation on setting digital standards, South Korea hopes to expand its global reach as a technological leader and also become one of the world's top three powers in artificial intelligence. Oh Seung, Arirang News. President Yun Song yeol held a phone call with Singapore's new Prime Minister Lawrence Wong on Monday and discussed ways to strengthen bilateral relations ahead of the 50th anniversary of opening diplomatic ties next year. Yun congratulated Wong, who took office last week. Calling Singapore a key partner, President Yoon called for the bolstering of cooperation in the digital, AI and infrastructure sectors. Wong thanked Yoon and talked of working together to further elevate bilateral relations in various fields, including politics, the economies and culture. He also suggested stronger cooperation in AI ahead of the AI Seoul Summit. South Korea and Japan are expected to hold a defense ministerial meeting in Singapore later this month. 
during which the two sides are likely to touch upon the 2018 patrol aircraft dispute once again to prevent a recurrence. Our defense correspondent Chen Minzhong has more. A Japanese national newspaper has hinted that South Korea and Japan will soon resume bilateral defense exchanges, which have been on hold since the 2018 patrol aircraft dispute. Yomiuri Shimbun on Monday reported that the defense ministers of the two sides are expected to meet on the sidelines of the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore at the end of the month, where they're expected to hold talks and exchange documents on preventing a recurrence. The dispute flared up in December 2018 when a Japanese maritime patrol aircraft flew at an unusually low altitude over a South Korean warship. Tokyo, on the other hand, accused the South Korean vessel of locking its fire control radar. Talks have been suspended since 2019. South Korea's defense ministry confirmed that the two sides are currently in talks. South Korea and Japan already confirmed their positions last year regarding this issue and decided to prepare measures to prevent a recurrence from a future-oriented perspective. We are closely cooperating with Japan. Japan's media has acknowledged that the incident has been the biggest barrier between the defense authorities of Seoul and Tokyo and turned the spotlight on whether the resumption of defense exchanges will serve as an opportunity to rebuild trust between the two sides. Chen Min-dong, Arirang News. In a press conference today, South Korea's unification minister revealed some changes to the organization of the North Korean Workers' Party in what appears to be Pyongyang's effort to deny the idea of reuni reunification. Our North Korean affairs correspondent Kim Jong-shi reports. Unification Minister Kim Yong-ho revealed new findings on North Korea while reaffirming Seoul's policy against the regime in a press conference on Monday. The North hasn't announced it yet, but its United Front Department has renamed the Workers' Party Central Committee Bureau 10, and its functions have been centralized on psychological warfare. North Korea's United Front Department served as a counterpart to South Korea's Ministry of Unification. A senior ministry official said the change means Pyongyang is now only focusing on espionage against the South and not efforts related to reunification. Other experts said it was notable that the North had decided to keep the department intact, although under a different name. When asked about former President Moon Jae-in's recent memoir in which he wrote he trusted Kim Jong-un's sincerity, that he has no intention of using nuclear weapons, the minister responded as follows. What's most important is to read our counterpart's intention and capability. North Korea has the capability to threaten us through its nuclear and missile development. If we only focus on its intention while overlooking its ability, this could lead to a misjudgment of the state. He said one of the toughest challenges remaining was Pyongyang's refusal to engage in dialogue. The inter-Korean communication channel should resume regardless of the political and military situation, at least for humanitarian purposes and disaster response measures. It's urgent to restore such channels ahead of the monsoon season. The minister plans to visit Seonyudo Beach this Friday along with U.S. Special Envoy Julie Turner, where 16-year-old Kim Young-nam was abducted by the North in 1978 to raise awareness of the issue. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. New Taiwan President William Lai ching Da called on China to stop threatening the Democratic island. Lai's remarks came on Monday as he was sworn in as the new president as in a as at his inauguration ceremony, pledging to uphold Taiwan's constitution in relations with China. He urged Beijing to accept Taiwan's existence, respect the choice of Taiwan, show sincerity, and replace military confrontation with dialogue. Lai also showed his willingness to have cooperative exchanges with China on equal terms, starting with the tourism and education sectors. On the local front, with the government doctor's conflict well into three months, the authorities are renewing their request for trainee doctors to return to work by today so they can meet requirements for next year's specialist examinations. Our Yi Eun-hee tells us more. 
The ongoing medical disputes over the government's plan to increase South Korea's medical school quota is persisting, with the government urging trainee doctors who have been absent for three months to return to work on Monday to fulfill the training period requirements needed to qualify for next year's specialist certification examinations. At a Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasure Headquarters meeting on Monday, Health Minister Cho gyu hong said that while individual circumstances may vary, trainee doctors who left their positions starting from February 19th must return by today, which marked three months of absence. However, the government added that it will be flexible for those who have extended leave or sick leave. And as they continue their efforts to convince trainee doctors to return to hospitals, the government also expressed hope that medical students would return to school. Meanwhile, the 2025 university admission plan, which reflects the increased number of medical school admissions, is expected to be finalized by this Friday, May 24th. As details including the selection ratio for regional talent recruitment and the ratios of regular and early admissions have not yet been made public, the finalization of the admission plan will likely prompt students to begin preparing for their exams. The Korean Council for University Education will hold a university admissions committee meeting this week to review and approve the 2025 university admission plan amendments submitted by universities nationwide. According to a council representative on Sunday, the committee needs to approve the plan this week to enable universities to announce their admission guidelines by the end of this month. Regarding the enforcement of administrative measures such as license suspensions, a presidential office spokesperson said Sunday that each case will be looked at on an individual basis, with administrative measures against the medical professionals who have left their workplace to depend on their behavioral shifts since they began their protest. The official added that the government is currently evaluating the timing, severity and approach of these measures. Ian Hee, Arirang News. The top office has apologized for causing confusion by announcing a ban on overseas items that are not KC certified, a certification that proves items meet Korea's safety regulations. This came from President's Chief of Staff for Policy, Song Tae-yoon, on Monday, a day after the government officially scrapped the new policy just three days after it was announced due to backlash from the public that it limits the choice of consumption. Song added the president has instructed measures to prevent the recurrence of these types of situations by conducting stronger policy reviews and enhancing public consultations, among others. Earlier today at the National Assembly, the ruling People Power Party's interim emergency leader, Hwang woo and the main opposition Democratic Party of Korea's Lee Jae-myung agreed on the need for cooperation between the rival parties. In what was their first official discussion since becoming heads of their respective parties, taking place just two days after their greeting each other during Saturday's national ceremony, remembering the May 18 Gwangju democratization movement, Hwang vowed that the PPP would join forces with the DP to work on resolving national issues and growing South Korea's national power. To which, he said, they should strive for frequent conversations as the role of politics is respecting differences in opinions to reach common ground. It's been two years since South Korea's former presidential office, Cheongwadae, or the Blue House, was open to the public. Our An Song Jin takes a look at the range of events taking place in celebration. Back to the people. South Korea's Blue House, also known as Cheongwadae, is marking two years since it first opened its doors to the public on May 10, 2022. After President Yoon suk yeol moved the presidential office to Yongsanggu District, the previous office located in Jongnogu District has been holding a range of events, as well as tours inside, a series of art, music and media performances are taking place which will continue throughout the summer. Special exhibitions will be on display, such as Handshakes for Freedom, which shows records of diplomatic efforts, and Children Drawing Hope, an exhibition of Ukrainian children's art. And there will be classical music, jazz, and K-pop concerts. Among the various events that are taking place at the Blue House, this traditional performance festival offers a wide range of Korean folk music and dance performances. Samulnori, traditional music with four percussion instruments, was performed on the stage. The showcase, a collaboration between four universities, uses the themes of joy, pleasure, sorrow, and anger to show the lives of people in the past. 
Another concert blends Korean folk music and jazz, and visitors could also enjoy a traditional Hawe mask performance, which is a satire on the lives of people during the Joseon dynasty. A culture expert said that such events can help bring the Blue House and the people closer. Opening this area as a cultural complex space like this allows more communication with the people, but above all, how it's used is the most important. A historical museum that displays historical records of the Blue House can make it even more future-oriented. The Culture Ministry and Blue House Foundation aim to brand the Blue House as a culture and art space that can be enjoyed by citizens, and such events will further help create that identity. An Songjin, Arirang News. Today's what's called Soman, which marks the beginning of summer on the lunar calendar. Early summer heat continued in Chungcheongnam-do province, and in Daegu, temperatures rose to 30 degrees Celsius. However, in central and northern areas, including Seoul, light rain fell with cloudy weather. Tomorrow will be mostly sunny across the country, and it will be hot in the central parts of the country. In the middle of the day tomorrow, the UV rays will soar in most parts of the country, except Gyeongsangbuk-do province, from high to very high. You might want to put on sunscreen to protect your skin. Tomorrow's Seoul and Busan will start off at 16 degrees. Highs will move up to 28 in Seoul, Chuncheon, Daejeon, and Gwangju. Throughout the week, hot weather is expected to continue with daytime temperatures exceeding 25 degrees. That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world. Well, that is all for this newscast tonight. Thank you for watching. We'll be back with the latest news at 9 a.m. tomorrow with New Day at Arirang. Hope everyone has a great start to the week.